Okay, we're ready. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're here at Wei Mountain Temple uh, to continue discussing uh, Master Shenhua's Chan Chi instructions. Let's get into it. Get started. Cannot hear you. There was another eminent monk at the Xiangming Temple in Jingzhou. This eminent monk was named Sung Fu. Fu means assistance, help, and support. In his younger years, he specialized in practicing and upholding precepts. He was diligent in upholding precepts. He was determined to practice asceticism. He practiced asceticism that ordinary people aren't able to endure. He specialized in studying Shastras. He mastered all Shastras, but he also understood the Buddha Dharma and Sutras as well. So during that time, in the Hunan region, the majority of people had faith in him. At that time, in the Western Jin Dynasty, the political situation was chaotic and unsafe. Sung Fu and Shi Daoan and many others lived in seclusion in Huoze. Together, they lived in seclusion to investigate the Buddha Dharma, to investigate the sutras. Mm -hmm. 
So they investigated until they were able to penetrate the wonderful meaning of the sutras. Later, he lived in Xiangming Temple in Jingzhu. He was vigorous his whole life, specializing in upholding precepts. He was vegetarian and practiced repentance. Every day he bowed and repented. He was very vigorous. He vowed to be reborn in the Tushita heavens and to meet Maitreya Bodhisattva. His wish was to meet Maitreya Bodhisattva. At that time, Wang Chen of Longya was the governor of Jingzhu. He heard that Master's Wei Virtue was advanced and profound. Therefore, he invited the master to his house. The whole family took both refuge and precepts with him. Two days before his death, he told everyone, I will leave tomorrow. If you have any questions, ask now. If you don't ask now, in the future, when I am gone, there will be no one for you to ask. The following day, everyone smelled extraordinary fragrances filling the air. It was as if music was playing in empty space. All of his disciples heard their master was leaving. So they all came to see him. At 
that time, over 10,000 people went to visit him. After seeing him, he sat there and passed away without illness, without illness. Okay, let's stop here. Got the story? 20 slides. That's it. Any questions, comments? See now, you look so peaceful. Would you like, you have two more days ago? <laughs> One or two? T tomorrow. Tomorrow? <laughs> She looks so nice. No. <laughs> During the lecture. Okay. 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 We practice some compassion tonight. We will not take a vote. <laughs> okay. So now um, we're talking about, we're learning about this uh, eminent monk, Chinese monk, by the name of Sang Fu. Mm. And uh, Fu means to help and support. Mm. He, these uh, people have a lot of blessings. So even though oh, Buddhism was uh, new in China, uh, when did uh, Bodhidharma, Great Master Bodhidharma, brought Buddhism to China? Anyone remembers? Hmm? So this is before? This is before he brought it over. Mm, no wonder. Mm. Okay. Uh, so because as I was listening to it, I was wondering what happened to these uh, Mahayana practices. Okay. Mm. All right. So anyway, uh, DTT question. Yeah. Master, I have a question. Okay. The um, Master Sheng Fu, if he just uh, learn about the Shastra and the Sutra and without practicing meditation, can he um, understand, uh, have the ability to understand the Sutra and Shastra? Yeah, very good. Let me get to that. When we're not at that slide yet, but eventually when we get to it, we, I'll address it. Okay? Uh, good question. Anyone else? Okay. So, well, he, first thing that's remarkable about him is that he didn't waste his, uh, his uh, time. He didn't waste time. Uh, DTT still has a question? Go ahead, DTT. No questions? No questions. Okay, fine. So he became a monk at a younger age, which is uh, interesting because usually at younger age, people are usually more excited about living life, at least in our times in the US. So he was um, more interested in living the pure life. So he, uh, so he jumped right into uh, practicing the precepts, okay? And he was very diligent, so this is pretty impressive. It takes a lot of blessings to be able to practice precepts. So you see that this monk has a lot of prior blessings, okay? Especially he didn't have back then uh, without the proper, the training that we inherited from Master Xinhua, uh, it's, uh, they, were, they were practicing in the dark. And so fundamentally, if you didn't know, you should start with looking at precepts. But for you to be able to uphold precepts, it takes a lot of blessings. So you see this monk here, to me, uh, has a lot of blessings already. That's why he's, uh, he, he specializes right into precepts right away. Okay, at a young age. 
uh, and besides, he doesn't live that long anyway. Uh, so he not only was he practicing precepts, he was uh, also practicing asceticism, uh, ascetic practices, the tough ones. Uh, not sure which ones. I'm pretty sure they're not the same as the one that we learned uh, here from Master Shenhua, the way Master Shenhua transmitted to us. Uh, they're different, uh, but uh, uh, but for him to go into precepts and then specialize in asceticism, that's uh, that's a very very strict, very rigorous. Why would you practice asceticism? asceticism? Hmm? We know what that is. Uh, they are the practices of uh, of uh, the ascetics. Ascetics are the ones that withdraw from the world, and they uh, minimize uh, their dependencies on a lot of things. I don't know which ones he's, uh, which practices that he did, but for example, uh, you eat less. Uh, so you would eat one meal a day, okay, like Master Shimha taught us. You would wear, for example, the way we learn from Master Shinoha again, that's my reference points. You wear three ropes, okay, that's it. Uh, you sit, sleep, okay, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, and the rope you wear from, from rags, you, you don't uh, go and order Western-made uh, fabric, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and you, 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 you're, you're lacking in so, so many things. So you live to the bare minimal, okay? Uh, anyone remembers what are the ascetic practices that, uh, that you know of? Master O. Abbott. Hmm, doesn't remember. Okay. Uh, what about uh, J, uh, 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 DDT answer? Of course, as I'm talking, you should look it up. Come on. <laughs> First, I, I heard about um, staying in a cemetery too. Stay under a tree. Okay. Uh, staying in Aranyas, you live in pure places. All right. What else do you remember? What else you, does it strikes up uh, uh, interest in you? Hmm? Anyone? Okay. The twelve ascetic practices uh, that uh, we learn from Master Shenhua, uh, and uh, uh, the ascetic practices. Uh, are designed to minimize your dependency on external things in your daily lives. Look at ourselves. We depend on so many things. For example, we need a roof of our head. So that's why that dependency right there, okay, uh, the, for the ascetic uh, practitioners, uh, they would live uh, under a tree, okay? and subject to the elements and the wind and the seasons and the changing seasons and so forth. It's kind of tough, especially if you were in, uh, in, in, uh, in Thailand, for example, you practice city practices, it can be very hot in the summer and there are lots of bugs and so forth, all right? And so it's very, very challenging. Uh, food, we eat one meal a day, don't sit sleep. Uh, uh, you, you, I'm sorry, you sit sleep. You minimize the, the clothing requirements you have. Okay? And somehow today, I'm, I, there's, there's, there's 12 of them, so it's quite a few more that I doesn't come to mind at all. Okay? Anyone uh, looked up? The set of practices? No? JC answer. Yeah, 12 the tying is 첫 번째는 
고요한 곳에 머무르면서 세속을 멀리한다. 두 번째는 언제나 걸식하면서 어, 공양을 따로 받지 않는다. 세 번째는 걸식할 때는 마을의 일곱 집을 차례로 찾아가서 빈부를 따지지 않고 걸식하며 일곱 집에서 밥을 먹지 못하면 그날 먹지 않는다. 네 번째는 하루에 한 차례를 한 자리에서 먹고 거듭 먹지 않는다. 다섯 번째는 항상 배고프지 않을 정도로만 먹고 바로 안에 든 음식에만 만족한다. 여섯 번째는 정오가 지나면 과일 즉 성밀 따위도 마시지 않는다. 일곱 번째는 좋은 옷을 입지 않고 헌 옷을 빨아 기워서 입는다. 여덟 번째는 네이, 상의, 중의 등세 가지 옷만 가진다. 아홉 번째는 무덤 곁에 머물면서 무상관을 닦는다. 열 번째는 쉴 때는 정자나 집을 택하지 않고 나무 밑에서 쉰다. 열한 번째는 나무 아래에서 자면 습기, 독충, 새똥 등의 피해를 입을 수 있으므로 한 대에 앉는다. 열두 번째는 앉기만 하고 눕지 않는다. 이상 열두 가지입니다. 오케이 Yeah. Make uh, go uh, uh, Make, on yeah. arms uh, rounds, okay? Yes. Make for food. And, you don't cook. Yes. Okay. You back in. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> third thing, uh, you always back for food, and when you back for food, uh, you go to seven places, seven houses. And uh, if you don't get offering from them, you don't eat that day. God, that's terrible. Uh, sorry. Uh, you, it's, called, it's called sequential begging, meaning you go to seven consecutive houses, and then you beg for food. And when you beg, when you go in front of someone of one's house, you, don't, uh, you simply stand there, and you hold the bowl in front of you, and you don't do anything. You don't ring a bell, you know, like a handbell, ding, or hit a, uh, a chant, or hit a drum or something to draw attention to yourself. You simply sit there, stand up there quietly for a while. If no one comes out, you move on to the next house. And after seven houses, uh, and you stop. If you have nothing, you go back empty-handed. And if, uh, and then next, and then if you, you can, can only fill up the bowl, that's why in China, in Asia, in Thailand, for example, the bowl is that big. <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> our bowl, you see how, how small our bowls are? <laughs> they're Thai, you know, they're very practical. <laughs> Continue, please, that's very good. I don't, I don't. And the fourth one is uh, you eat only one time a day and you only eat at, at one place. At what? You only eat at one place, one oh. time a day. One place, meaning that, yes, you eat and then you don't, once you stand up, you're done. You cannot, what it means is that you cannot eat here, okay, at, uh, you eat pho here. Hey, Koreans, <laughs> pho, okay? I say, hmm, I'm still not full. Let's go get some pizza. <laughs> so that you cannot stand up. That's the rule, okay? All right, very good. That's why you don't, you don't go to a restaurant. You usually go to a food court. And you order everything you want right there, and you bring it back. 
Next. Steps one is uh, you eat uh, until you're only not uh, until you're not hungry, and you satisfy with the food inside your bowl. Okay, so you you eat and uh, you, you feel. That's it. That I didn't learn that one. Hmm. Okay. Where, where's the source here? The uh, the yoga order training. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I didn't learn that rule. Next. After twelve p.m., you don't drink juice too. Okay. You don't. You stop eating after noon. And then after uh, in the afternoon, you don't drink and you don't take uh, you don't take uh, juices. Am I correct? That's correct. Okay. All right. There are exceptions, uh, but asceticism uh, you you don't uh, you don't drink after you don't uh, take any juices. No tea, no coffee after noon. Okay, uh, water only. Next. You don't wear good uh, clothing. You only wear old clothing and yeah. sew the clothing. Yeah, you don't wear custom-made clothing. Uh, and usually, back then it's simple. The monks and nuns, they wear this, uh, this, uh, this sash. They didn't wear like we do nowadays, it's very fancy what we have. What they have is just a sash in the Buddha's time. So the sash is just a piece, uh, you know, rectangular piece of cloth they put together by going to the, gather their, the discarded cloth, uh, wash them thoroughly, and then, and then sew them together. Okay, uh, so yeah, uh, very, very simple clothing. Next. You only have um, three robes. It's uh, inner clothing, outer clothing, and uh, uh, inner clothing, upper clothing, and middle clothing? I don't know. Yeah, we have three only sashes. Have three. Yeah, three sashes, like Master Shenhua. One time, he only wore three sashes, no pajamas. Okay. Uh, it's pretty cold if you are in China. Huh? In the winter time, it gets very, very cold. If you only wear three sashes, I don't know how you're going to survive. Okay, yeah, impressive. Next. You stay uh, near the cemetery and uh, contemplate Mushang. Mushang? Mushangguanel Tangnanda. What's that? I forgot. <laughs> I know you stay in the cemetery. You spend the night in the cemetery. And you contemplate impermanence, I think. Oh? Huh? What's Master, the that's right. The Mushan is the impermanence. Okay. Wu Chang. Wu Chang. Okay. Very good. Next. That's the one that's dangerous. You stay in a cemetery, is the ghosts will possess you. I would not recommend it. Okay, next. Wu Chan Guan. Okay, contemplate impermanence. Very good. This is you don't uh, when you rest, you don't go into houses. You rest under the trees. Yeah, you stay under the tree. You don't go to houses, hotels, Airbnb. Eleventh is when you stay underneath the tree. Maybe there's a humidity or bugs or uh, bird poo. <laughs> So you just sit in one place. Mm, you don't lie down. No, that's the uh, twelve. Uh, twelve. Uh, the twelve you know, is not lying this down. Is eleven. Oh, twelve okay. is not lying down. Mm, I don't understand eleven. What's eleven again then? Uh, because of the humidity and bugs, uh, 
underneath the tree. So you just sit in one place. Mm. Hmm? What's the purpose of that? I don't understand. I didn't learn this. This would sound familiar to me. Three. In English, it says sitting in charnel grounds. Charnel grounds. That's uh, you sit on on the. Uh, uh, on the ground where I think they burn bodies or something, the cremate bodies maybe. Uh, yes, in the back. Master, I think I remember one time you say that you cannot you cannot stay in a place uh, over three nights. Uh, that's a precept. I'm not sure. Yeah, you're right. Probably maybe. Uh, um, the ascetic practices is that you cannot stay uh, uh, right. You cannot uh, stay more than, you cannot stay in the same place three nights, third night. After two nights, you have to move. Yes, three. So the charnel ground is a simple, simple a place where bodies are disposed of, either by cremation or burial. Mm, I didn't learn that. I was uh, okay. I didn't know that. So each uh, there's slight variations on the ascetic practices. For example, the Hinayana, I think they got eleven or thirteen. Master Shinho taught us twelve, and he, and the Korean sources uh, have a slight variation. But the uh, but what's the purpose of the ascetic practices? Do you know? Let me tell you. The tip is. It came from the Buddha's practice. Because remember, Buddha was uh, under the, uh, the tree. He sat under the tree for 47 days. 49 or 47? 49 days. 49 days. Uh, and uh, lucky that he didn't die 49 days. Uh, anyway, uh, and so, he sat under the tree for 49 days, and then before that, okay, so he sat under the Bodhi tree, so he observed all these ascetic practices, severe ascetic practices. And before that, he was in Snow Mountain for six years, or starving himself to death, to the point where he was skin and bones, okay? And so you see, the Buddha, when he was uh, practicing uh, on his own, he was doing the ascetic practices. And so, of course, his condition, the conditions were worse, and they were amenable for him to do ascetic practices because he had no choice when you have no support yeah, and, and so forth. But, but the, it came from what he learned from the practices himself. So of all the hardships that he endured, the Buddha endured, he said, I will teach you 12 ascetic practices or 11 or 13, whatever, whatever number that it's recorded in the scriptures, okay? They are from the Buddha's experience and they're designed, so the Buddha summarized all his experience as these are the 13 aspects uh, of mental dependencies you have. It's fascinating. And the Buddhists have so much wisdom that when Buddhists and, and Bodhisattvas teach us something, it's for our sakes. It's not for them. It's because they went through it themselves. So they realize that the ascetic practices are designed to point out to us our heavy attachments. Okay, for example, remember, you, you eat in one sitting, you don't get up. If you get up, then you cannot, you have to finish, you finish eating, okay? And so in the precepts, when we set up, when we get up, then, then we have a dharma that enables us to continue. If you don't uh, engage in ascetic practices, there are ways for you to continue eating. It's not a problem. Uh, you, you know, there's a process. 
Okay. Uh, and, but, but look at that. Look at that. You know, this is this is tendency of, let's say, you go and get some food and you enjoy certain food more than others. So the tendency, you eat it quickly and you get up and go get some more. Get more dumplings, get more pho, get more steaks and so forth. Okay? And so it's a natural tendency for us uh, to do that. So this one sitting here, it, it's, uh, that's it. So you, you learn to be content with enough food for yourself. Okay? And the clothing, uh, for example, is another example of, of how, how, how much we depend on clothing. If you only have three sashes, uh, a limited amount of clothing, then when it gets cold, you have to deal with it. Okay, and it's a very good way to build your Kung Fu. By the way, I, like, I meant to make this uh, comment for you. When I started at my master's uh, temples uh, at the uh, city 10,000 Buddhas or at all his uh, way places, uh, uh, except for in Canada where it's very cold, uh, where it snowed and so forth, uh, we typically would not use heaters at all. In a city 10,000 Buddhas, it got so cold, it got to be sometimes in the morning, below 30, you know, freezing temperature sometimes. And we would walk from, a, from our monastery to the Buddha hall outdoors, okay? And then we come back, you stand there an hour, you chant, and then you circumambulate. And the Buddha hall is cold, very, very cold, no heat whatsoever. So when you get in the morning, at least you have a blanket, so your body is still warm. Get out, you walk outside, all that heat evaporated. And then you have to stand there in the cold, in Buddha Hall, very cold, okay, for an hour. And then you had, you, and you, by the time uh, towards the end, towards the middle of the uh, ceremony, you're freezing. It's very, very tough, okay. And, and so, People need to dress up, so they put on a lot of uh, layers of clothing. Uh, and, and, uh, but uh, the thing is that uh, we are not supposed to turn on a heater, use heaters at all. First of all, because Master Shenhua is cheap, he says it's too expensive. So you have to manage with how. And so what they, people did is they, because it's a wooded area, so they have a lot of old trees. Oak trees are, they fell down. So they cut up the trees and serve it for firewood. We have plenty of firewood. So we would hurry back and huddle around the fire. We, there's a, there's a, 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 a container where, uh, uh, where we, we uh, a barrel, a metal barrel, we burn the firewood, okay, to keep ourselves warm. Well, but we're not supposed to, okay? And so, uh, what's the advantage? Uh, if you in that environment, even though you bulk up and everything, it really helps build your Kung Fu very, very fast. Whereas if you uh, turn on the heater, your defenses are down, okay? And so you don't build your Kung Fu, you, 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 when it's cold, you need to rev up your, 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 your engine. So you generate internal heat, and that's how you, uh, it's very, very good for your cultivation, okay? So that's why I'm reminding you, it's okay for you to use heaters, but if you do that, then you are not uh, giving yourself a chance to rev up your engine, to build up your Kung Fu. That's why I recommend that unless you're sick, don't turn on the heater, okay? If you're sick, you catch a cold or a flu, by all means, turn on the heater because your body is not, it's cold, it needs uh, heat, yang, so, so that you can counter the, the cold or virus, the flu virus. But if you're not, if you're not sick, endure it because it's better for you, okay?
Uh, anyway, mm. and so, so these, you know, you don't even know what it's like to have only three layers, like the Master Shinoa, uh, to endure the cold of the winter. And so you learn to heat yourself, your body up very, very, very fast. Okay? Uh, and yeah, I, heard, I read somewhere that he walked barefooted on ice. Uh, so, uh, very remarkable. Okay? Yeah. And so I read it. So when I was at a city of 10,000 Buddhas in a morning ceremony, I would wear a tennis, uh, I was a lay person, so I would wear a, uh, uh, a warm-up, uh, 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 Sergio Takini's uh, warm-up thing for tennis, okay? And I was around 40 degrees, 50 degrees, 40 degrees or so, I were, were, and I was still warm, okay? And then I took off my shoes and walked around barefooted. Okay. Uh, and... Um, my level is very low, but <laughs> but I did it anyway. And as soon as I, you know, so it's so cold, okay? Upstairs, you can really crank it up and keep yourself warm. The problem is that when your foot touches the, the, uh, the cold grounds, okay? Um, because the floor was like concrete, and then they put a thin layer of carpet, red carpet. I don't know, you remember, you go to that Buddha hall, old Buddha hall, and one layer of red carpet, okay, very dirty, okay? And, and so when you go barefoot, the cold really penetrates through your foot. It's very, very tough, okay? So it, very, it was very cold at first, and then, and then, then you, the heat is trapped under your foot, so you, you, you're able to manage. But as soon as you move your foot, it's very cold again, so I would never move. So it's perfect. <laughs> you stand still. <laughs> yeah, you have a question? <laughs> never mind. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. We all have a lot of crazy people here. Look at that. <laughs> Snow who is it? what is she doing? Well, it's normal for us. <laughs> now she changes her mudra. <laughs> uh, it's a good thing. People don't understand, and uh, that's a very, very good thing. Anyway, uh, and so this is so you you learn this, the 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 uh, the difficult circumstances really help you focus increase your focus okay and you may be laughing i was kind of vain and kind of you know want to stand wanted to stand out so i did was doing those things when those people around me they were they bulked up and their levels much 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 higher okay so it's so stupid. But what I learned, though, is that, is that uh, you can crank it up and retain the heat. So it's a very good way to sustain your concentration can keep the cold from entering your body. Okay? Uh, but I know that if I had stayed like two hours like that, I would have died. Okay, <laughs> so I was able to fight for an hour and hour and a half, and that's it. I go back to the animal <laughs> in a blanket. <laughs> yes, Jeju Island. Master just said, while I in Korea, the heating system is under the floor yeah. with the water pipe. So just uh, don't make confu confusion for people. Don't ton of the heater because when the pipe breaks in the winter it's very expensive to repair yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's like, a... like 11 degree hmm. yeah we have uh... to pay for the repair <laughs> i don't know it uh, i uh, i find that uh, the most difficult thing for me personally is not the air ambient air uh, the most difficult thing is the, your foot, 
the head, I can control it, okay, the chi flows. But the foot, when you touch its cold floors, is very, very tough. And yet, Master Xinhua was able to walk on ice, on, on snow, barefooted. That's why I tried, okay. Uh, uh, so the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, people who have four seasons, they're smarter. They have heated floors. That's very important. Okay, that's your, that's your, your base, all right? Uh, or if you wear socks, and that's another way to insulate yourself. Uh, so my point here is that, is that um, what I learned is that uh, even my, my samadhi level back then was about first dhyana, second dhyana. You can with, with, you know, withstand a lot of cold and you can uh, protect yourself, okay? Uh, so it's all in the mind. And uh, another thing I also learned is that uh, it's not necessary to do that because with first dhyana, second dhyana, and you can do that, and they're much higher than, than I was, I didn't have to do that. And the cultivation was better off. They were better off, okay? And so, you see, some of the ascetic practices uh, were extreme, so Master Shinhua really summarized them to only a set that are important for the practice. So that's a 12 ascetic practices. Master Shinhua only kept uh, a subset of that, and that's good enough for them to become enlightened and to go very, very far. And that's from experience, from, from wisdom. When you don't have a good no advisor, then you stick to the twelve ascetic practices because you cannot tell one from the other. So Master Shinhua, knowing that we are spoiled, we're weak, so he narrowed it down to sit sleeping, uh, eating one meal a day, and so forth. All right? It's from the wisdom here and what it takes to bring you there. Okay? Yeah. And then, of course, the ascetic practice is just a way of life. So what else did he do with his time? What all he did had back then was really no specific instructions how to do Chan and so forth. So what did they do? These people, they studied sutras and shastras. Now, uh, shastras are the uh, considered to be more difficult than sutras. Sutras are, sutras are the explanation or the, the uh, dharma spoken by the Buddhas that were collected. And then after that, the bodhisattvas, his disciples, would come to our world and make commentaries on the sutras, and they're collected as shastras. So shastras are basically are uh, authored by the Mahasattvas, Bodhisattvas, and sutras are the Buddhas. Okay, uh, and so uh, so he uh, and the Buddhas uh, they whispering to each other. They say shastras are more advanced than sutras. It's not so. It's so wrong. How can you say that the Bodhisattva's interpretation of the Buddhist teaching is more profound than the sutras? That's not possible. Buddhist teaching is so profound that even the uh, Sasha authors don't understand. Okay? And, and so, uh, so I was, uh, you know, I started with that. I said, Master Shinoa explained only one, a few Sastras. He explained mostly sutras. So, so that's why I studied as well, uh, just sutras. But later, as I began to understand more and more, I realized that many Buddhist scholars, especially monks, uh, and especially the scholars, would specialize in sastras. You heard of the great wisdom sastra? That's like the so-called most profound sastra, okay? Uh, uh, so the, these monks and nuns, for example, when I was in, uh, in Taiwan, their monks would say, I am a specialist in a great wisdom shastra. So he would explain the great wisdom shastra to us. 
Uh, and, uh, of course, he didn't get it. Okay? Now, looking back, he didn't understand. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and now we go to uh, pick up the matter brought up by Master Z. He says, what about sutras? Okay? And, and, and uh, how, what is the level of understanding of these, uh, this master, uh, Sung, what's his name again? Sung, Sung, Sung Fu. Hmm. Sung Fu. Uh, so what's his level? Uh, again, uh, again, our approach is different from theirs. Ours is from the patriarchs, and his was his own. He decided to do it on his own. Yes, nine. Yes, man, so I have a question. Uh, the practice of asceticism in Buddhism, uh, that's directly related to uh, the, the attempt to attain enlightenment, yes? Yes. It seems to be that that particular practice is, uh, is found in multiple religions all over the world. Yes. Okay, it reduces attachments. Okay, you open your wisdom by reducing attachments. So asceticism is a practice to, you know, of, of getting by with the bare minimum, meaning letting go a, a lot of attachments to cars, to houses, to abundant food, hmm, to comforts. Well, additionally, wouldn't that also, uh, it seems like in other, other cultures and religions, it's used as a form of... Uh, a personal punishment yes. to, to uh, you punish yourself, torture self yourself to the point. It's not, the, it's not punishment, it's self-deprivation. Yeah. You don't allow yourself to indulge. That's very important. Contrary to worldly people, it's okay for us to indulge ourselves. For these people, the practice of wisdom, the asceticism, and I'm glad you brought it up, uh, is that you don't allow yourself to indulge. That's a beautiful wisdom behind it. Don't indulge. But it's not just talk, but actually are doing it. See, people, especially nowadays, they talk too much. They don't do. Okay? These people are just the exact opposite. These monks and nuns, they practice, they don't say anything. See, there's a difference between the path of wisdom versus the path of the world. You talk, 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 and you make promises, and then you don't follow through. Okay? Whereas these people, they have no choice because they said, I will eat one meal a day. That's it. If I have, I bake, bake for food. If I don't have food, I go back hungry. Okay? Uh, and so forth. So these are the rules that helps them uh, uh, let go of a lot, a lot of uh, fundamental attachments, things that we take for granted. And if we don't realize those things that we depend on actually are confusing us. That's Buddhist wisdom. Well, the other religions also have asceticism, okay? But uh, they haven't gone all the way. That's why their rules of asceticism are not the same as ours. Ours is based on the fact the Buddha made it, and then his disciples, the patriarchs, made it, and, they, and so they related to us, transmitted that process to us. He said, if I can do it, so can you. And so a lot of people did that. A lot of Buddhist disciples did that as well, and it worked for them. So again, um, Buddhism is very, 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 very uh, fact-oriented. You don't talk about it. You produce results. It's results-oriented. 
is performance. Can you deliver or not? Okay? Uh, and so, uh, so uh, it's, it's kind of, the ascetic practices are not popular nowadays because it doesn't pay anymore. No one knows. And therefore, how on earth are you going to get support for your ascetic practices? Especially monks and nuns nowadays. Uh, the Sunims are gone, huh? Oh, uh, the monks and nuns need to support themselves. They need to pay for health insurance, uh, transportation, food, clothing, and so forth. How are they going to get support? Okay, If the Buddhist disciples don't know what they're doing, number one. Ascetic practices, you don't talk about it. You don't say, okay, I eat one meal a day, you know, that kind of thing. Or I wear only three, three, uh, three sashes and no more. Okay? I don't sit, sleep, and do those things. It's advertising yourself. So if people don't know, how are they going to come and support you? And that's why many monks and nuns nowadays, Vietnamese monks and nuns, they go and get a job, okay, to support themselves, okay? But when you go and get a job, then it's not according to precepts, because you allow a lay person to yell at you. Say, you idiot! I told you to do this! And so they're insulting what? To put jewel. Think about it. Just because we need to support ourselves, you go to a job and have a lay person insult triple jewel. Not good. Not good for the monks and nuns who get a job, who hold the jobs. Not good at all. Yes, they still continue to do it, monks and nuns, but they are Legit, legitimizing lay people, insulting triple jewel. That's very serious offense. Okay? Mm. Well, again, I just have a big mouth. Don't pay attention to me. You have a job, work, okay? It's your life. Yeah. I just, just have my, my, my limited uh, uh, opinion, that's all. A DTT. 그 득타인 중에 빈부를 가리지 않고 차례대로 걸식한다가 이제 그 나왔는데 빈부를 가리지 않고 차례대로 걸식하는 그 고행이 어떠한 집착을 줄여주는지 궁금해서 질문 드려봤습니다. Uh, in aesthetic practices, there's a part where you say when you um, beg for food, you don't discriminate uh, between the rich houses and poor houses. And I want to know uh, why this part helps you uh, cultivate. Why does it help? When you go to, uh, to rich houses, the food is better. The poor houses, they don't have food even for, to feed themselves. So we try to avoid the poor quarters. that we're not supposed to discriminate. Okay? Uh, all right. Going back to slide 148. Mm. Again, I'm glad we're here on this slide here because I have uh, always uh, was in brainwashed by the Chinese that the Shastras are more advanced than Sutras. I just told you today. No, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with the Chinese. Okay. I don't know where I picked it up from, but it seems that it's, uh, it's uh, like uh, monks and nuns in uh, Taiwan, for example, they, they said uh, 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 the people who explain sastras are advanced monks, are, are to be revered. And, and uh, personally, I recommend you study sutras. Don't do sastras. If you master the sutras, then you can do shastras. Okay? Uh, uh, to me, shastras, I read a few. I'm not impressed with shastras. 
I feel their lack depth. For example, how can you possibly compare any Shasta with the Avatamsaka Sutra? That's impossible. I just cited one example for you to see how profound the sutras are. So study sutras. They're exactly what uh, Master Seng Fu did. He studied sutras, but he specialized in shastras, which is, again, is a Chinese thing, and we don't have to subscribe to it, okay? Cut it out. You don't have to. You can ignore shastras as far as I'm concerned. There's plenty of great sutras you can go into that you can enrich the treasure of the uh, Mahayana text in English, which I hope you will. Uh, all right? Mm. Now, going back to Master Z's question about uh, what kind of uh, level of comprehension can this guy have? Again, uh, if he specializes in studying Shastras, it tells you that he's not very high. Okay? Uh, I... Again, I don't think much of the monks who say, I am a specialist in Shastras, only to impress lay people. Okay. Uh, uh, of course, at back then, uh, Seng Fu didn't have uh, flower adornment sutra, therefore, who knows? Okay. Uh, but that's point number one. Point number two, the training is different. Even though See, his emphasis was he started out with precepts, okay? Uh, and that's very remarkable. Uh, and then he went into uh, shastras and sutras, okay? Mm. Uh, so that's his style of cultivation. Our is different. Our is chan, okay? Uh, but actually, our chan is both vinaya and sutras as well. So our Chan appears to be Chan. Actually, my time here is actually explaining you about precepts and about sutras as well, the Buddhist principles. Okay, so, uh, so actually, even when we teach Chan to you, Okay, lay people, we're also teaching you about precepts as well, but you don't realize it. Okay, and that's why fundamentally Buddhist teachings is about the three studies, precepts, Chan, and, uh, and wisdom, precepts, samadhi, and wisdom. Okay, Chan there uh, on the surface seems to be only samadhi, but actually, it combines the way we teach up, the way Master Xinhua cleverly did it, more than Xu Yun, more than the other masters, is because he used this expedient of teaching Chan, even though he's not a Chan specialist, he's a secret school specialist, okay? But he still used Chan. Under the guise of Chan, he actually taught three things, precepts, meditation, or samadhi, and wisdom, which is now. See that? So that's the difference in the training. Master Seng Fu didn't have the proper training, and therefore, what level can, can he have? Uh, I don't think it's very high. Okay? Uh, because our approach is different. Here's a problem. If you start out with sutras and shashas, That, that process of training uh, would hinder uh, how high you go. So that's why Master Shenhua is much more clever. Okay? He says, I'm not going to bother you with all the knowledge about sutras and shastras okay? or precepts. I'm going to teach you enough, but I build your samadhi here. And then once you've got samadhi level high, you can read anything and understand everything at your level. You see that? So you're not bothered at all. You're not encumbered by all the excess baggage that you don't know which one to let go 
in order for you to go to this level. You see? So Master Xinhua and is, is very, very judicious. It's so ingenious in the way he did it to my generation. Is that in this, his recipe, okay, is combined three th studies under the guise of Chan, okay? Uh, but, uh, uh, and he has a track record of doing that, and then, and then once you do that, then you will have a chance to go and study sutras in yourself on your own. Uh, here's where it gets confusing for his disciples of my generation. He says, I, will, I, I teach you here. He didn't explain it as clearly as I do. I, I train you here, but you should specialize in one sutra. For example, Shrangama Sutra, uh, Vasha Sutra, uh, Lotus Sutra, or whatever, or Avatamsaka Sutra. You can specialize, okay? I don't even tell you that. I'm telling you, don't worry about it. I want you to practice Chan, and our Chan is just as wide as his, okay? Uh, and once uh, you get up there, and you say, okay, master, now what do you want me to do? I, I'm, I said, what, what, what do you want to do? He says, I want to become a Dharma master. Then I say, okay, and then study sutras. All right, so it's different. We, we build you up first. I'm not, I'm not even telling you to specialize in one sutra at all. You don't have to at all. And this is where I differ again. Hey, uh, uh, Xian Tong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't tell me how come, how come Master Srinhua uh, tells uh, uh, his disciples to specialize one sutra. I said, don't specialize. It's too soon for you. And that's exactly in the spirit of Master XZ's question. I don't want you to specialize at all. I want you to learn everything now, okay? Uh, I want you to go up there very quickly first, and then you can specialize later. It's much faster for you to go up first because I'm giving you minimal baggage. The more you know, the more you get a big head. That's what happened to my peers. They said, I've studied the Avatamsak Sutra and the Master Shrinhua for 25 years. I say, oh yeah? So what, how much do you understand? Hmm? Explain sutra to me. Print an explanation for me. Here's this chapter. Explain it to me. Okay? And so what happened is that people, they said, I've studied this Avatam Saka Sutra, which is uh, Master Shenhua's specialty, uh, for 25 years. Okay? Uh, that knowledge right there, that assertion right there, is baggage. They don't realize in saying that it, it hinders their going up, increasing their samadhi power. That's why Master Shenhua is wrong. Don't specialize. Don't need to specialize. All I want you to do and again, remember at one time, Peter, who now uh, moved to Northern California with his wife? Okay. Did you know that, huh? G.I. Joe? He decided to pick up his stuff and move uh, this morning. Wow. Yeah. Wow is correct. It's just like that. And these people are such free spirits. We have roots, you know. They just flutter in the wind. Say hello to them. Welcome <laughs> to Northern California. Go where the spirit of Buddha takes you. Look at that. Now all of a sudden DTT is populated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm drawing more distinction. When Peter asked me, he said, what is this patriarch thing? And I said, if you don't know, you didn't know, stick to the patriarchs. Stick to Master Shenhua, I highly recommend it. Okay, uh, 
I'm different. Uh, but again, if there's discrepancies, stick to Master Shinhua until you become enlightened. Okay? That's a safer route. Uh, but those of you who believe me, I point out to you with my differences because I saw the result of his approach to my peers. Okay? Uh, it's too soon uh, to carry that much baggage. That's why I didn't get up and then, they go, oh, I am, um, I studied Avatamsa Sutra for 25 years, 30 years, 40 years. How long have you studied? I said, I read it once. I, I didn't understand. He said, see? <laughs> but now I'm explaining it. Are you? <laughs> Are you simply re reciting it? You're not explaining. I'm explaining. Well, I'm BSing, you know that. Uh, you see, the point here is that you don't need that excess baggage. Is that's a very traditional Chinese thing. And, and uh, so my disease is very perceptive. Our approach is not that. I want you to go up very, very fast. I'm going to push you up as much as I can. And, and my disciples say, you tell me I'm on the way up there, but I don't understand anything. Precisely, that's why you're up there. You only need to know enough to get up there. You don't need to know all, carry all that baggage. And now, once you're up there, you can do anything you want, okay? Go to Germany, study sutras, sastras, whatever suits your fancy. It's not a problem. You are your own boss. You can choose whatever interests you, okay? Hmm. And so, uh, so again, the, the corporate line is that trust the patriarch. I would trust, follow Master Shin Hoas if you are new, okay? If you want to learn Buddhism, learn from the patriarchs. Those of you who know me uh, and, and have faith in me, then my instructions are actually faster than his instructions because I learn from his mistakes. We all are learning, by the way. I'm sure in the next generation we say, don't listen to Master Yong Hoa. Yeah, I disagree with him. I say, oh, goody, I have such disciples, you know? <laughs> All right? Yeah. Questions? So our approach clearly is much different from the Chinese. That's why we call that American. The Chinese, whatever, the Chinese, the Korean, and so forth, is very Asian. They're very traditional, okay? And what we do now uh, is one of the most important training part is right now, where I teach you uh, to know enough and then use certain teaching to bring you up very, very quickly. All right? That's a difference. Okay? Again, officially, we always recommend people, uh, new people, to follow the patriarchs, okay? We are no patriarchs. That's the truth. Okay? Mm. That's a system in Buddhism. They should follow patriarchs. Only the one who has humongous blessings will be able to keep up with us. Questions? All right. Uh, so he, again, you know, that's all he did. And the majority of people have faith in him. Uh, of course, he's a, he's a superior person. Are you able to practice ascetic practices, like Master Shen Hua said? If uh, the ascetic practices in Buddhism are very important, because as long as there are people practicing it, Buddhism still is here in the world. And that's great. Mm. But again, what Master Shen Hua did for us is that he, he took only a subset of ascetic practices that are much more helpful for our times. Buddha's time is different. Uh, our times, he's, he used a subset of ascetic practices to, practice, to, to teach us. Okay? Uh, and, 
And if you say, but what about the Buddha saying that you know, ascetic practices, uh, as long as they're, you know, the, the story of uh, Venerable Mahakashyapa, who's number one in ascetic practices, who practiced, uh, who kept, his, uh, kept up with his ascetic practices for his entire life. So when Mahakashyapa was around uh, 120 years old or something, he's the longest living, one of the longest living arhats under the Buddha. And the Buddha said, you old, why don't you take it easy? Uh, don't be so hard on yourself. Mahakashyapa uh, just smiled, didn't say anything. And so Buddha prays, he said, he's number one in ascetic practices. And as long as the people practice ascetic practices, Buddhism will remain in the world. So this is why it's highly revered, okay? Uh, as uh, for the monks and nuns who practice ascetic practices. Okay, it's very difficult. And it's a beautiful thing if you can do that then it's very helpful to Buddhism. Uh, we're not the same. Our times are that we uh, try to avoid appearing to be extreme because we've been accused, we, we are perceived to be a cult first anyway already. Even Master Shenhua is a cult. The other monks and nuns call him as, you know, they didn't like him. He's a threat to them. So he himself was considered to be extreme, to sit, sleep, and eat one meal a day, and so forth. It's too extreme for the Vietnamese or the Chinese and so forth. Okay? We're even worse. We have no uh, recognition, no certification. So, so for us to, we try to avoid extreme things. Uh, Okay? and that are not helpful, uh, and that would uh, cause more uh, people to worsen their impressions of us. Okay? Mm. But not that we're worried about it. Even though we're not worried about it, we should tr still try to avoid alienating people okay? uh, without reason. Mm. So, um, so we, I feel that ascetic practices uh, would be, uh, if we were to put that kind of emphasis as Master Sung Fu, I would tell you that he would have very few monks and nuns who can practice like he does, he did. And my interest is to build uh, as many, train as many, many monks as possible and nuns as possible who are competent, who can, who can uh, go out on their own if they wish to, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, be, uh, and be uh, big contributors to Buddhism in the world. And so uh, ascetic practices, I feel that it's not that helpful, except for the subset of the Mahasheshenhua select. Selected. All right. Hmm. All right. And so back then, uh, the common wisdom, general wisdom, was that if your monk really practices ascetic practices, he's a superior monk. So a lot of people believe in him and uh, respect him, admire him. Okay, they really admire him. It's very difficult hmm. practice. Uh, and uh, uh, 150, at that time, uh, their country, China, was very unstable. So what did uh, Master Sung Fu and Tao An uh, have to do? They, uh, they became hermits, and they practiced in seclusion, in Ho Zhe. Mm. Okay? And so uh, that's according with conditions. Uh, and uh, nothing to worry about if you are virtuous and you practice as per the Buddha's instructions, uh, then people will support you, especially these, these monks and nuns like Master Sung Fu and Master Tao An who was able to practice uh, for a long time like this. They have some Kung Fu as well. So 
uh, that surely they shouldn't have to worry about it. I need to point it out to you, monks and nuns as well, young monks and nuns, okay? And it's very important for you first to get training. Uh, back then, it's different for them. Sung Fu and Tao An, they had a lot of support, and they had prior blessings already for them to be able, for Sung Fu to be able to practice ascetic practices. Okay? You can't unless you have a lot of blessings. Yeah. Again? Again? Ascetic practices, no one knows. How are you going to get support? Okay? It's easier for me to uh, tell people that I have a hole in my roof I need to be fixing. People will give money for that. But when you practice ascetic practices, you, you can't tell anyone anything. You can't tell people, hey, I sit sleep at night. And that's bragging. And that's advertising yourself. That's not ascetic practices. Okay? And so, so uh, these people had blessings before. Uh, so that's why they're able to do these things on their own. Okay? Uh, so young monks and nuns nowadays, it's very important for you to first receive training. Get the proper foundation first. And unlike you, Master Tao An, Master Sung Fu, didn't have the proper foundation. That's why they can, could get by with a lot of blessings, uh, but they didn't get up very high up there in terms of samadhi and wisdom. Okay? Mm. Uh, so uh, when they didn't have, when the condition were not favorable, they could be in seclusion, meaning the blessings are enough for people to come and secretly support them. Okay? Live in seclusion in a mountain. You don't need a whole lot. You, you plant your own food, okay, and so forth. So There's not a whole lot that you need. Okay? Very minimal. Mm. Uh, but, but remember that, you know, you, it's very important for you to, uh, when you first start, uh, to, to get some, some, some support, to learn support and protection, to learn the proper, to receive the proper training. Okay? Uh, otherwise, if you don't have the proper training, you don't have enough samadhi, you cannot survive. Okay? Mm. Times are much harder now where the young people, after this uh, generation of uh, my generation, when the old people die, you will get not much more support. That's it. Because that's why I'm preparing you. You need to build skills to justify your existence. Okay? Uh, my generation, they know I'm a monk, so they're supposed to come and make offerings to me. They see me in a restaurant, they're supposed to come and pay for my food. Okay? Few do. Okay? But, um, uh, but at least some, you know, at that generation, we, they still are taught to do that. They're supposed to make uh, offerings, a triple jewel, okay, without being asked. Okay? Uh, but in your generation, the young people are not taught anymore. So... It's very tough for you. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's imperative for my generation to invest in you so that Master Xunhua uh, invested in my generation and bought a lot of properties saying that I will use them so that in the future people can use them. Mm -hmm. I'm not worried about that. My approach is that I build your samadhi level. I build your skills. And if you're useful, people will come and give you temples and cars and food and clothing because you're useful to society. Back then, there, the value system is that you're supposed to protect and support Triple Jewel because Triple Jewel, everyone believed to be very beneficial to society. The knowledge, the belief is not there anymore. So we need to be, you know, to accord with the times. And justify our existence. Okay? And so far, we're lucky. Hmm? Hmm? We have a lot of a mixture of old people and young people coming to support the temple. Hmm? All right? So, uh, and unless we train you and help you, uh, 
the, the fewer young people who are willing to become monks and nuns because they know how tough it is. Okay? Either they are enamored by all the big, te big temple, all the money that comes with it, okay? uh, from the old generation. Mm. Uh, but mm. but uh, with that money uh, comes corruption. You know that? Can we gossip a little? The Vatican, the bank of the Vatican, the cardinal in charge of it was removed by the Pope. He was considered to be one of the uh, next few to be in line for succession. You know, the Bank of Vatican is, controls all the money. And, and it's very powerful, it's very opaque. You cannot see anything. Okay, and it was, it's a position of trust. And the, the Pope finally removed that cardinal unceremoniously. And uh, is basic, basically, he retired in disgrace internally. Too much money. Imagine you need to build a new wing to the church. Hmm? Imagine that general contractors, architects, would come in. And how are you going to distinguish yourself? It's a lot of money involved. And so that's why the finances department uh, has to be very pure. And apparently they have issues. And I would, I would guarantee you the issues will be there forever. Okay? And that's why you know, our approach is different. We're not worried about temples, worried about money. I want you to worry about enlightenment. When you're enlightened, you are free. Uh, you cannot be corrupted by money, by fame, by all those things. Then you can be trusted. And that's inherent in the structure. If you have too much money, you put too much money in the hands of people who have no wisdom, corruption follows. Everywhere. Not just in Catholicism, it's in Buddhism as well. You have too much money, says corruption. Unless the people who are in charge have wisdom. When they have wisdom, they cannot be corrupted by money or anything. See? So going back to Master Z's point, you don't worry about all these superficial things, the sutras and so forth. It's too premature. Worry about your purity. Worry about your wisdom first. And then you can penetrate the Buddha's teachings in sutras. Each level of samadhi, you can only penetrate so much it's only so much wisdom you can harness. That's it. When you reach sutras, this is all you can get out of it. You want more, you have to increase your samadhi before you can get more. So that's why the training we do is samadhi. Push you up, okay? Teach you enough so that you can move up. That's the process. No need to, no need to, to, so it's very focused, yes. narrowly focused so that you get pushed up on that elevator. Okay, don't worry about the building yet. So build up an eleva elevator shaft and push, pull it up. That's American Buddhism. Yes, three. Thank you, Master. I have a question just in general. Um, as time goes on, and let's say you go ahead and retire in the Bahamas, and uh, we have your Sangha here teaching us, um, will we still have sudden teaching? We'll see. Sudden teaching depends on the good no advisors. Hopefully, there should be. Okay? Definitely. Uh, we try to. Uh, 
but uh, but uh, uh, because if we didn't, then the level of Mahayana is too low. Yes, you don't realize even like one simple thing. You don't have pure land. Your level is not high enough. Pure land is extremely advanced. One of the toughest dharma is this pure land. Chan is easy. But pure land is very, very difficult. Very, very advanced. And Masha Shehua never taught them because they're not good enough. Yes, five. Thank you, Master. Um, we will have a lot of uh, material on, on the internet, on YouTube. Can we still get the certain teaching from watching the, the videos of you, Master? Yeah, there's some. Buddhist teaching is certain teaching. Okay? Uh, but uh, is no replacement for a person to look at you who have been following you. Okay? Uh, for example, you know, uh, to, to to tell you the truth, uh, some of my uh, left home people are very, very uh, manic. So they bully my disciples around. We're not going to mention names, okay? Don't ask me. They butt heads with you, and they're stronger, and therefore it hurts. Uh -huh. I see that. And because of that, lay people left the temple and said, this is, you guys have no compassion, you guys have, uh, 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 are not treating us properly. And therefore, a lot of people, we lost a lot of people. Okay? Uh, but um, I never said anything. Because I, that's part of my cultivation is to endure it. A temple with no disciples, <laughs> no lay people. <laughs> Why should I be afraid? Okay? I have to practice too. If I practice, oh, oh, oh don't leave, don't leave, stay with me, stay with me. Okay, okay, I apologize. Okay, if you, you're upset, uh, just call me, call me. Okay? So, um, if I, uh, so, you see, uh, so I have to endure it. And after I endure enough, I say, okay, so it doesn't bother me anymore that there's no people coming to the temple and we don't have any food, don't have any money. Okay, now it doesn't bother me anymore. Then I start teaching. You understand? My practice is that if it bothers me, I will not do anything. I endure it. Endure my sanghans bullying my lay people. Okay? Yeah. And so, but that's important because I endure Okay, because I need to endure as well. I need to practice patience as well. And then I'm learning how these ghosts and demons are manipulating my people. How are they making them depressed? How are they making them manic? How do they function? So that's why, ma'am, we're very experienced because I watch it day in, day out. You guys only see your patients once a week. I see them every day. I need to endure it every day. They throw tantrums at me every day. As soon as I tell them anything, Mass is so mean, why are you so mean to me? What did I do to you? <laughs> Very appropriate. <laughs> Everything is about training, folks. I'm training you. I'm also letting you train me by irritating me to death. 
<laughs> and that's why you irritate me to death and you see I have no reaction, you quit. I say, oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Don't come back. Yes, five. Oh, Master, would you say that we need to have a, a healthy ego before we try to grow spiritually? Because I see, like, even in my own life, there was a time I was a deeply wounded ego, tried to do spiritual practice. It didn't really go well for me. I think psychotherapy really helped me to come to some balance. And then now when I approach spirituality, I find it really different. So would you say there is some value in trying to get some healthy ego before embarking on a spiritual journey? Yeah, it's fair to say that, but, it's, but not in those terms. The ego, in order for you to learn to control your ego, there is a certain way of doing it. In Buddhism, we, only, we are the only ones who specialize in doing that, and who excel at doing that. Non-Buddhist approaches, they are confusing. They will not, will not help you control your ego because they still have an ego. Your teacher must have no ego before he knows how to bring you there. Okay? And so, uh, yes, you can ca uh, classify, categorize it as healthy ego and so forth. It's still thoughts. It doesn't matter. It's about knowing how to get out of trouble. It's, it's okay to be in trouble. It's okay to fail. But as long as you don't quit, you learn how to succeed. That's all. It's not about knowing. It's about, so I have this problem. I'm hungry, let's say. He says, are you hungry? Then what do you want to do about it? He says, so you learn to solve your problems with what you have instead of daydreaming. And that's wisdom. You don't say, I'm hungry, so I wish I had five bucks to buy, you know, an In-N-Out burger, which only costs three and a half bucks. And give me a buck and a half for some Coke. I mean, Pepsi. I hate Coke. <laughs> okay? And so forth. So it's not that. It's about there's a, reg, a regimen, there's a regime of, of, uh, of this process of training where we cannot tell you, we cannot explain to you, because your ego will be cornered eventually and then kill it with gusto. It's, uh, Finally, same thing I'm doing with my people. They bully people, they scare people away. I say, I watch, I say, okay. Okay? It's not time yet. When the time is right, they'll be taught. And some people take very fast, okay? I, I tell them, they pick it up very fast. Some people are very slow. One person you know, can, can catch it, or the person takes uh, 20 times, 20, re 20 times. They need to be reminded 20 times. Some people forever, every single time. Okay? But you still can get there. So it's not about, it's no, there's no one size fit all kind of thing. Each person is different, each day is different. So there's no formula at all. If you want to understand, give me a general rule, a general rule, do what you're told. When I tell you to do something, do it. Don't ask why, don't try to understand. If you do it, then you get there. That's all, okay? Understanding will not help you deal with your ego. Yes, JMT.
Cô con trả lời cái câu hỏi ngày hôm qua là cái đá thắng phước đó thầy. Mm. Oh yeah, the, the answer to yesterday's uh, what is that relic thing? Tức là cái đá đó, đó là bên Nam Tông họ rất là quý trọng. Và sư bà Pháp Đạt đó được người ta cũng dường một cái tượng Phật cao khoảng 1 mét bằng ngọc. Thì kèm theo là khoảng 10 kg đá đó, đó. Để, để theo cái tượng đó thì bên Nam Tông họ giải thích là cái đá nó tạo cái phước cho cái người hành giả. Nên con xin một một miếng như vậy để cho cái tạo tạo thêm cái phước của mình. Thì mình bắt đầu mình nghĩ là nó mê tín vậy đoan nhưng mà người ta đã có truyền thống như vậy rồi. Và thứ hai mình tạo thêm cái phước nữa mà mình không không có cái gì là phạm giới hết có cũng được không có cũng được thành ra không phải là tham nhưng mà con giữ nó con thấy nó cũng có kết quả và cái cục đá nó cũng có cái, cái hình thù nó có biến dạng nó biến thêm khác ừ. thì con thấy trên đó người ta đặt là đá thắng phước ừ. tạo thêm phước cho người hành giả thôi ừ. ok go ahead translate Yeah, thank you for uh, the photo. That's very nice of you. Very thoughtful. Hello, Master. I would like to answer the question yesterday about the Supreme Blessing uh, uh, relics. Uh, is that so? This uh, relics is very important in the uh, Hindiana or Theravada tradition. It was uh, so venerable, Onan uh, Fabdak was offered a big uh, statue made of jewel and together with a uh, 10 kilos of this uh, supreme blessing rock and so at first i just think that if it is the it is superior blessing is to trying to create a blessing for the people who happen to encounter that so it's not about uh, greedy to keep it or not. So that's why I bring that to our temple and so that uh, I see that the result, the shape of the uh, rock itself change and it reform in a different way. So it is just to create the superior blessings for those cultivators, that's all. Do you grow bigger or uh, what, what do you mean by changing the, the shape? Is it bigger? Bây giờ cái cái hình bây giờ đó con không biết là chụp lúc nào nhưng mà thấy có vẻ nó khác đó nhưng mà mình quan sát thì cái tổng hình của nó có thể nó biến đổi khác lớn hơn hoặc là sao đó. So, so in essence here, this is um, a uh, uh, belief from the Hinayana practitioners. Hinayana, they are actually have more affinities with the uh, relics than we do. And we're simply uh, using up their expertise. They have a lot of great responses from relics. Uh, and so they're funneling some of these uh, relics to us, which we really appreciate. Okay, and so in essence, uh, you go there, and depending on your affinities with these different types of relics, uh, you're uh, going to these uh, to see these relics and make offering to these relics will bring you a lot of blessings. All right, thank you, oh, the old uh, venerable abbot. Okay, uh, great. Um, time is up. Anyone has a final question or comment? Three. Thank you, Master. Uh, I'd like to remind our YouTube audience to please like and subscribe. Uh, but I'd also like to mention that in closing, that we will have another Rolex exhibit in uh, Northern California and Southern California on February 10th through 18th. So in about uh, six, seven weeks? Yes. Mm, yes it's Master. Lunar New Year. Lunar New Year, yes. Yeah, that's our Korean, our uh, tradition, yes. And I believe the uh, Supreme Blessing Rock will be seen at DTT. Is that Very what it good. is? At yeah. DTT. It's at DTT. Yes, yeah. thank you, Master. Okay, thank you for the reminder. Go ahead, Korean YouTube. Thank you, Master. Uh, 
서로 일식하는 것을 통해 많은 복을 수입할 수 있다고 들었습니다. 앉아서 자는 것도 복을 절축할 수 있는 방편일까요? Uh, I believe this is Kwang Ho. Uh, he asked, uh, by eating one meal a day, I heard that you can save a lot of blessings. Is it uh, sit sleeping also to uh, save your blessings? One of experience? I'm sorry, the question. I miss a few words. Repeat the question, please. By eating one meal a day. Oh, eating heard, one meal a day. By eating one yeah. meal a day, mm -hmm. you can save a lot of blessings, I heard. Yeah. And is it sit sleeping also the other way to save blessings? What? To save blessings? Sit sleeping. Sleeping. No. It's not, not to say blessing, it's to build blessings. When you sit sleep, you create a lot of blessings. Eating one meal a day uh, is a, you know, a form of ascetic practice that will help you create a lot of blessings and saving a lot of blessings. You're saving the food you're not consuming. Okay? But the primary thing is not really saving food. Okay? The primary thing is about creating blessings by undertaking these ascetic practices. Okay. Uh, second, saving food and saving Mother Earth is uh, never a consideration to the Buddhists. It's nonsense. As for worldly people, we don't need to save Mother Earth. Mother Earth is our slaves. Hey, mom, <laughs> cook. <laughs> like it? <laughs> GMT. <laughs> you call your mom, that's it. You serve us, OK? <laughs> if those of you are mom know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> your kids order you around. <laughs> yes, GMT. Vì là Phật nói về ngủ ngồi Thì ở bên Hàn Quốc này có cái bà cụ 90 tuổi Hồi cách đây 5 năm con gặp ở sông Yong Sa đó 90 tuổi người cư sĩ mà ngủ ngồi mà close leg mà 50 năm Một cái ấn tượng rất là con học từ bà này Đó là ngủ ngồi đó cái bà đó 90 bởi bên này nếu mà còn bắt bà phải 96 Bởi hồi nút gặp bà là 90 ừ. Năm nay 5 năm rồi ừ. Chục năm ngủ ngồi Ừ. Sĩ thôi. Amitofo, Master, so talking about uh, sit sleeping, so here in Korea, I ha have a chance to meet with this old lady. She, at that time, she was 90 years old, and I met her at Pam Yongsa. Um, she sits, has been sit sleep for 50 years. I took a very good impression of her, and I learned that lesson from her. So up to now, uh, I think six years already, she might be 56 years old. She is only a lay person and was able to sit sleep for 50 years. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. But uh, she should have reached a much higher level of enlightenment practicing 50 years. Okay? See, all these, you, you can talk all you want. You say, I, you know, I'm a uh, Dharma master, I have PhD, I have, uh, I have pimples, I have whatever. You know, uh, bottom line is, what is your level? What is your stature? What is your status? Can you sit in the full lotus, in the lotus days? Okay, that's real status. Whatever you, whether you eat 10 meals a day, 20, 20, I have 20,000 disciples, but you, but uh, you sit in, in a lotus days, in golden lotus days, with the purple golden lotus days. That's the bottom line. Okay? Hmm. 
all these people, these practices like this guy here, uh, he's, uh, can I finish this? Since I'm going to gossip anyway, huh? there's not much left. Okay. Uh, so, you see, these people are pretty impressive, but I'm very American. Okay. Bottom line, what is your level? It's like in America, how much money you have. <laughs> okay. You can talk all you want. Okay. Uh, so, they practice, uh, they, uh, and to, to them to say that they're able to penetrate the wonderful meaning of sutras, that's overstating it. I would not say that. Okay? Uh, they believe they understood more than the other monks and nuns. Yes. But to say that they penetrated the wonderful meaning of the sutras, no. Okay? This is not a good thing to ever say. You should say that, wow, uh, they found that the more they study, the more they realized they didn't understand sutras at all. Okay? Don't say you understand the wonderful meaning of sutras. You ain't seen nothing yet. And vigorous whole life upholding precepts, that's all they know. That's why all these precepts here is like a, a whole list of all sorts of precepts they uphold because they don't know which ones that's more important for them to go to the next level. You understand? It's like blindly, okay, I'm eating, I'm eating Chinese, Korean, Russian, German, Vietnamese food to feed my body. I so rotate every day, small dishes. How does it help? The American would say, which one is more important? Hmm? You don't, that's why you study all the precepts. You uphold all the precepts. You know, to say that you uphold all precepts, to me, is nonsense. Let me tell you about precepts. Precepts are to be broken. Next. Don't quote me. You learn from mistakes. If you are successful, then why do you say you're upholding precepts? Have you thought about it? I, I'm, it irks me, and these people say, I'm, I uphold precepts clearly. You uphold precepts clearly, then why are you still upholding precepts? It should be second nature. You're no longer upholding precepts. Hmm? Why do you use chopsticks the proper way? <laughs> okay? Do you say, I'm using prop chopsticks to eat? I'm just eating. You don't even say, I'm even, I'm even using chopsticks. I just pick up and I use it, right? It's just a tool. Precepts are just a tool. Get it? You see, I'm not impressed with this Chinese thing. I used to be so impressed. Wow, this is so wonderful. And it's okay to impress, you know, the them Chinese people. Okay? Uh, but I'm too Americanized. I says, really? So you bragging about precepts? If you are so pure, there's no more precepts you are upholding. Huh? You see, no more precepts to be upheld. That's how pure you are. What, what, what are precepts? Precepts that you will not eat before, uh, after, after 12 o'clock, 12 p.m. Take one example, something you understand. Okay? So you, you do, do you go to lunch and say, oh, I'm going to have to stop at 12. You know, everyone, I want to stop at 12. Please remember to remind me to stop at 12. You uphold so nicely, you naturally eat and stop before 12. You don't, you don't even have to think about it. That's 
pure precepts. It's no more upholding. That's my standards I want you to have. Let the Chinese uphold pure precepts. We don't uphold precepts. It's nothing to uphold. You're so pure. There's no need to uphold anymore. That's how you live. Okay? I'm more radical. Okay? Vegetarian, okay? Practice repentance every day. So he still repents. <laughs> if he repents, let me tell you, if he repents, meaning he's violating precepts. Otherwise, why would you need to repent? <laughs> Don't be fooled by all these, you know, the Chinese uh, 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 mystique that they say, okay, so mystical here, that, you know, that, that they're so pure. <sighs> Please. <laughs> you have to repent every day and bow and repent it. Very rigorous, of course. You're breaking precepts like crazy. If I were to reborn to Tushita heaven to meet my tray Bodhisattva, seriously? <laughs> Go to Amitabha Buddha. I'm going to slap you in your face if you go up to Amitreya. Uh, I think we, we went to 64, right? 164. And so the governor, Hervin, and of course, you know, what politician, what do they know? They want to have the picture taken. So he invited her and took refuge and took a picture. Oh, Master, co conduct a special three virtues ceremony for my family. Look, look at the photo, I approve. <laughs> Politicians. Hmm. So before he said, I'm leaving tomorrow. Now I like. He doesn't say, I'm reincarnating. <laughs> <laughs> Ask now, have any questions? He cares. That's I like. He says, you know, uh, I know you have a lot of questions. Ask, ask. Don't, don't miss the chance. I can save you a lot of time. Uh, and, and the nice thing about this, what's impressive about it is that when he died, the room was filled with fragrance and this music. That means that the heavenly beings came to pay tribute, homage, homage to him. Okay, that's why the fragrance is from the heavenly beings and the spirits, and the music is from the heaven. That's why it's like it came from empty space. Okay, it's like they played in the heavens up there, and they sent it to the internet, to our speakers. So it came from nowhere. No one is playing, but... <laughs> okay, so cool. Okay, this is, a, uh, this is a recognition of the heavenly beings, of his virtues. Hmm. And they're grateful to him. They learn a lot from him. Uh, and he says, uh, you know, I, 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 I want to help you before I go. So uh, this is a reminder. Your questions uh, in your training, you have to ask questions because that's how you uh, get taught. Okay? Uh, it's not like after my master died, we're not allowed to ask questions anymore. We're allowed to ask, have five minutes, ten minutes to ask questions. That sucks. He says here, right here, he says, ask questions before I leave. I go, you have to ask me questions. Anything you want to ask, okay? And so the, the herd, 10,000 people visited him and he passed away without illness, okay? That's a good death, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, otherwise he'd be in big trouble. And uh, so you see, he has a very, he has a pure life, even though he practiced ascetic practices, he's very virtuous. That's why he didn't commit a lot of offenses. That's why he was without illnesses, okay? Mm. 
And, uh, and that is where we are. Yes? Thank you, everyone, uh, for your questions, your comments. And uh, we see you next, uh, next week. And uh, continue this thing next week. Tomorrow is lectures. Okay, good night. Mm-hmm.